Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first parallel session. This afternoon, we have five presentations. So we will try to start now because otherwise we will finish on time and then we want to have questions and things like that. So we shouldn't lose time. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the first presenter of this afternoon. His name is Wendell. Medeiros Leal. <laughs> and okay, the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Wendel Medeiros Leal. I am a PhD student at the University of the Azores in Portugal, but I'm from Brazil. And today I will be, talk will be talking about making the biomass of priority exploited from the Azores. So, uh, stock assessment models uh, provides knowledge uh, of the historical and current uh, harvester harvester resources, and and also predictions of the future of the population dynamics, which contributes to management uh, strategies. Traditional stock assessment uh, models uh, needed substantial data sets, such as the the total catch, the absolute or relative abundance index, and um, fishing effort information and age structure data. However, uh, sometimes these data are not available to take a limited features, uh, such as the small scale features. And the application of these models uh, are not possible. Uh, in this context of the small scale features, uh, several new stock assessment methods have been developed in the last years. These methods using a uh, length data composition or cat only catch the data, data or proxies of abundance. In the Azores, the fishing is a, is a significant activity with a great economic value in the region. And um, it's, class, uh, it's classified as small scale fishers because it's basically exp uh, exploited by small vessels and, uh, and exploiting also several uh, different species. The main fishing gears used in the Azores are the, the bottom line and the fend lines. Um, this mix of uh, different uh, species exploited in the Azores recently 22 were classified as priority stocks to management and, uh, and assessment under the marine strategy framework and the 14 uh, in the sustainable development go 14. And these stocks can be classified in uh, coastal species such as the, the lobsters, uh, the large species such as the, um, uh, the, the, under, uh, the macros and the missile species such as the, the red part, Black spot green and the uh, common model. And these these dimensional species can also can be divided in three subgroups according to the bathymetry distribution. The shallow water demersal species, the intermediate uh, demersal species, and the, the deep water demersal species. 85% of the total landings in the Azores are represented by the, the intermediate uh, demersal species and the pelagic species. So the follow framework was adopted in the, in the present uh, study and first was explored all the database of landings, LPUE, CPUE and survey abundance index. Uh, these data were collected uh, by the DCF program and the DMSIS annual monitoring program. The next step was uh, to, to, to test the applicability, uh, the, the applicability of the each model based on the data availability. Uh, the, CAT, the CMSOI model was the, the most simple model used in terms of the data follow the PSCM and the speak model. After the performance of the each model, um, the Azorian priority stocks were classified in their correspondent uh, stock status. The over or in overfishing or overfishing stocks possible rebuilding or overfishing stocks and sustainable stocks. Uh, in, based in the results of the, this performance, uh, the, were estimated the reference points of the biomass and uh, we can provide some management advice. 
So, dear results, the CMSY uh, was applied in all 22 priority stocks because you just need to have landings or catch data. Uh, based on the CMSY results, mo the most of the Azorian priority stocks are currently exploited in sustainable levels. Therefore, the, the fishing mortality rates shown in this red square are high, and the biomass levels are lower than the, M the MSY shown in this yellow square. These stocks were classified in 54% uh, in possible rebuilding for overfishing, 27% in overfishing or overfishing, and just 19% in sustainable stocks. The BSCM model um, was applied for 21 priority stocks. For this model, uh, landings or, or catch and, and a, a process of abundance index are required for to run the model. Uh, however, uh, these proxies of abundance uh, is, uh, are just necessary uh, short time <laughs> series with a minimum of nine years. Um, based on, on these results um, the, from the BSEM, the, the priority uh, uh, Azorian stocks are now uh, exploited in, uh, uh, also in unsustainable levels with high fishing mortality levels and the biomass uh, rates and the biomass levels uh, are lower than the MSY. The growth limit was removed in this analysis because these species don't have any bonus units. And the, the stocks uh, were classified as in 52% uh, in uh, possible rebuilding or overfished stocks, and 34% uh, in overfished, and just 14% in sustainable stocks. The, the, the last model was the stick model and was applied in 17 prior, uh, 17 prior stocks. Uh, for this model are necessary landings and a series of abundance with the same intervals. And the, the growth limits also was removed from this analysis. And the spine lobster and sleep lobster, umberjack and the flex covered fish were removed from this analysis because the model did not converge. And the results uh, for the stick model show that the, the fishing mortality rates in the Azor, for the prior and Azorian stocks is, are high, and the biomass levels are significantly lower uh, than the MSY. And these stocks were classified in 53% in uh, overfishing status, 30% in sustainable level, and just 17% in possible rebuilding. Uh, and based on these results, uh, the three models converge to the same stock status, and these, these results indicate that the most of the Azorian priority stocks uh, have low biomass levels and are intensely exploited in the, in the Azores. These results stay in agreement with uh, the IC's classification of the, the, the um, current exploitation level in the Azores in the last fishery review. So, uh, and the exploitation of the Azorian bird stocks uh, seems to follow a uh, special distribution of the fishing effort uh, from shallow water to deep waters. First, the fisher overfishing the coastal and pelagic species. After this, uh, the fisher overfishing the intermediate, uh, the meso species. The shell, sorry, the, the shallow water species. And after this, the intermediate, uh, the meso species. This results suggest an expansion of the fishing effort, the Azorian uh, fleets to offshore areas since, uh, <laughs> since 2002, because the, in this year, several uh, management measures were adopted in the region, meaning with focus in the creation of the ex exclusion zones uh, to fish. Uh, when we can see, so in, see in this map the, the changes of the, the, the operation of the fleet and go to the, the seamount areas uh, close to the islands. In the conclusion, the impact of the overfishing in the Azorian priority stocks are, the, are 86%, and we can provide also some management measures to help to recover these exploited stocks, such as the, the, better, the better application of the TCs, the reduction of the fishing effort, maybe creation of the marine protect areas, exploration of the new uh, potential fishing, fishing uh, resource. And also, of course, this, this better application of these management measures, uh, we need to discuss these, these results with the fishers because maybe these, these, these results 
can be unreliable, reliable, because we have some uh, gaps in the database, mainly for the coastal species and the pelagic species. Uh, uh, basically, these, these uh, species have uh, unreported data, and we need to check better this, this performance of this model for these, these species. And that's it. Thank you for your attention, and thanks also for the FCT for the PhD Scholar Grant and the Okeans for the Turbo Grant. Thank you. Ten minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> have we questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. Just, just a, a question. I mean, have you have you seen in accounting any way, or you have you done uh, you account any way the socioeconomic information associated to this uh, sort of data? Because we are just taking decision according by just in a really so we are not only yeah. social and economic issues and I think it's an important point. But the move the, the, the shift of the fleets from deep to deeper out of the water is because economic the decisions I mean there is less productivity in the shore so they go deeper and deeper looking for the fish play. So I think economic and social elements are very important in this to incorporate in the models. But the models you have mentioned can include some way this economic issue. So it would be a good point uh, if you have the time to introduce this information for in yeah. some way. Yeah, tomorrow my colleague will be present the, their, uh, uh, his results and just about this, this approach, uh, triple bottom line approach using the economic data, biological data, and social aspect. And uh, we are uh, welcome to, to solve these different kind of application models. Thank you. Two questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, this problem is mainly for the coastal and the pelagic species because we have uh, uh, the fishers in the in the Azores, the commercial fishers, and the recre recreational fishers, and uh, and in, around the island, the people go to fish. Is uh, uh, for example, both limpid, lobsters, or pelagic species, and this information are not reported to the, to the lands. They, actually, they, we have a, a, a app, and you can send the information about the, the, the fishes target. But sometimes this information is not truly reliable to, to understand the, the, the abundant trends. And uh, we have also already uh, reconstruct reconstructions of the total catch for some of these species using uh, interviews, uh, inquiries, uh, et cetera, for to, uh, to have this abundance trends, but it's not official data. And we can use also this data for sensitivity analysis, but it's not official. And it's explore, explore, exploratory analysis and we also to try to use other alternative uh, models to apply for this resource with this, this um, unreliability in the data of the <laughs> relation. Uh, I have a question. Hi, I'm curious about the process of testing models work on the ICC course piece, or is something you have worked on? Sorry, can you repeat, please? Um, have you used yeah, uh, I use uh, the length data composition for the ICS data for uh, models, LBSPR and LBI. These results uh, are submitted on a paper, but what was not applied for all these talks because the coastal species don't have uh, any length composition. Uh, the pelagic species, the model not converge, but uh, uh, have a, a, not a good fit because we have two modes of the length composition with uh, different uh, metiers exploiting the, the pelagic species. And for these stocks, the speak model is a method to apply in data for situations recommended by ISIS. <coughs> we are checking if we have uh, questions right here, from the people of Slides uh, online, not stock. I was on the first slide. We'll see. 
questions. No, no, no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Partner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the nice questions. And we invite our second presenter of this afternoon, Victor Gastelum. Okay, I can start. <clears throat> All right. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you. I've been told that I have to stay put in front of the computer. Uh, that might be hard for me, so you will have to signal if I start. I have a tendency to move when I talk. Uh, I will present uh, findings from an article that we call Dead in the Water, Sustainability and Direct Seafood Sales in Sweden, that I have co-written with my colleague, Maris Boy Gillette. Um, as you see, sustainability is in the title here. And we employed a, a special framework to try to get beyond the fussiness of that word um, that's called sustainable materialism, developed by a couple of political scientists, uh, Craven, Coles, and Schlossberg. I will not go into that today, but if anybody of you are interested, I'm happy to talk to you later about it. I will say more with our empirical findings from this. Um, yes, and when we're here imagining low impact and safe fishing, um, in this article, we, we started at three points, I would say, uh, that sort of drives our research question. And one is that many researchers, many that we've heard here today, argue and emphasize the the low impact of uh, small-scale fishing, depending on fishing methods, depending on intimate knowledge of local marine environments, uh, and also that they catch low volumes that they can sell low higher prices. As we all know, small-scale fisheries in, in Sweden, in Europe, and in places elsewhere are in a steep decline. And we have different levels of policy makers suggesting that direct sales of the cat uh, could be some sort of remedy for small-scale fisheries. They can add value um, by creating local market where they gain higher prices for their catch. So the question that we posed was, does direct seafood marketing sustain small-scale coastal fishers in Sweden? And Thus, their low impact fishing methods. We used national level data on Swedish fish provisioning and consumption. We researched or studied seven different operations that were scattered all along Sweden's quite long coast. Uh, we did interviews. Most of, not all, but most of this was done during COVID. So we did limited in person visits. Uh, we did um, look at newspaper coverage, small scale fisheries, which in Sweden follows a classic narrative of the last fisher in Port X is uh, yeah, now selling his fish directly or with fishing. Media narrative. And we attended uh, a number of meetings aimed at small scale fisheries and policymakers. Um, these, these direct marketing operations and uh, the fishers that, um, that <coughs> did it, operated them, um, fish in very diverse ecologies, uh, target a large number of different species, um, and were composed of, um, in many cases, just one fisher, uh, but in others, up to five, and even one that. It did 10, but were only two that were quite active uh, that direct marketing of. So one point for us was whether direct marketing contributes to making small scale fisheries livelihoods sustainable. And here's a quote from one of our interviewees that I think 
uh, says quite a bit about uh, how direct marketing for them. It, it poses possibilities, but it also poses obstacles. And some of the general patterns that emerged in this study are that all of the fishers who engaged in direct marketing needed other occupational activities outside of fishery. They, did, they had to rely on outside income. And they still had a need to sell fish in bulk. One of them sold all of his fish directly to customers, uh, but relied on other work. The rest of them had to sell some portion in bulk. They had to stay in the conventional food system to, to keep fishing. And how they felt about direct marketing, positive or negative, relayed quite a lot to what amount of their livelihood came from the direct marketing and what amount had to stay in the conventional food system. If they sold a lot, then the direct marketing was more of a hassle a lot of time and generated little income. But many of them emphasized uh, quite strongly that direct marketing still was key for them to keep fishing, what they all wanted. As the quote before uh, shows, it caused problems with industrial buyers who said that, okay, if you're gonna sell the best part of your fish yourself and not give it to me, if you're gonna sell a large part of the fish you catch uh, when you don't catch so much to others, and I'm not going to buy any more fish ever. So then, and, and they were all dependent on this. So they lost quite a, a very important, uh, if that conflict escalated uh, into a, a rupture, uh, they lost um, the grounds for living off the fish. They said that the number of customers in direct marketing was unpredictable and that the, um, the lack of knowledge among customers was a big issue. People doesn't know how to handle whole fish anymore. They are as, uh, was it Brian who said it uh, earlier today that, that people want frozen and fried products on cook with real fish actually. Um, the ways that the fishers themselves described their low environmental impact was that they were uh, fishing as many species as they could, so regulations limited this. Uh, we had one who himself uh, sold 17 different species. This is from the Baltic Sea, so that's quite a lot there, I'd say, including roach and eid, or not commonly eaten in Sweden. And, um, or a type of fish that is often seen as, as um, an environmental benefit when you remo remove because we have huge eutrophic. Uh, they stress that they use low impact gear, uh, large scale fisheries. They stressed that they try to reduce waste by using as much of the fish as possible. And they stressed the low food mice that they have compared to um, conventional fish in the conventional food system. And they stressed seasonality, which I think is an interesting aspect. Because what it's, <coughs> seasonality is quite often seen as eating in season is, is regarded as, as eating sustainable. But when it comes to fish, that's a bit different because the season is for the small scale fisheries is often when it's possible to fish fish. And then you would have a gastronomic side when it actually tastes the best. And then you might have a third season when it, on the stock is uh, when it does the least damage to it. So I'm, I'm quite unsure of the sustainability outcomes of um, seasonality in fishing when it's framed quite vaguely. Uh, direct marketing contributed to, to uh, strengthening fishing in coastal communities. Uh, it gave the fishers a sense of pride. Many of them uh, emphasize that, that they produce high quality fish for their customers. Um, 
they did build relationships outside of market transaction. The main finding was that fishers were transmitters of know about the, the ecosystem that they work in. But we found it mostly as a one way communication from fisher to uh, buyers. It was not really a dialogue going on there. Um, the fishers talked about the cultural heritage that they uh, keep, that, that they are preserving by their work. They really enjoyed the regulars, the discussions with them, but they wanted more of it. It was not a critical mass for many of them of uh, regular buyers. And we found limited or no networking with other organizations uh, in, in the local community at least not in any formalized ways. So, is direct marketing a remedy for small-scale fisheries in, uh, in crisis? We see that it has some potential to help small-scale fishers weather hardships caused by a number of factors. It does make a difference for them. Uh, it, it, it in, in some, maybe minor way, but in some way it enables them to keep on getting a livelihood from fishing. It does put fish on dinner plates that wouldn't end up here. It puts local fish on dinner plates, which is uh, really an exception to the, uh, yeah, to the big picture where we import more fish, I would say, than, than the average new. Um, they use low impact me methods, minimize waste, contribute to raising awareness of the state and local ecosystem. But we find it doesn't contribute enough. And what we see as the main fault when we look at, look at this is that there are very few uh, systematic measures to support direct market, to support small scale fisheries in, in a transition. Um, maybe both from grassroots movements uh, concerned with, with food and sustainability and uh, caring for local environments and caring for local people as the local small scale fishers. And what we see from top down is a suggestion that the that. Okay, so we have struggling fishers. You should diversify. You should yourselves add value and make it possible for you to make a living in this hard city. <laughs> and combined with maybe you should start doing some kind of tourism as well uh, and become something else than, than just a fish. Uh, we see this as, as part of that. Uh, and that it is basically devolving responsibility from top down, down to the individual. Right, thank you. Can we have time for one question? Okay. I... Yeah, but maybe uh, I have to say we have uh, five presenters today, but we are not sure if the last one is uh, Online? online? She's online. Okay, so I, we have I one need, question. I need to sorry. check. If we have one question. Who wants the one question? Okay. Yes. I, I have a question. Thank you very much. Uh, this is very interesting. Presentation. I don't know that much how does it work in Sweden, but here you say that, I, I don't know, maybe it's, a, it's an assumption. You assume that there is only uh, direct marketing channels. Be, uh, interesting for Austria. Is there any markets in the center of your country where you can also value the, the, the learnings uh, from small scale? And how do you consider this alternative according to your uh, in, uh, in this In this article, we specifically looked at direct market uh, for reasons where we connected that to wider definitions of sustainability we wanted to look at face to face interactions between producers and consumers and connect that to a sustainability debate that uh, 
comes from the local food. We really wanted to look at that. But there are initiatives, as the one you mentioned in Stockholm, they started a number of years ago, a uh, fish auction. We used to have only one in Sweden, uh, or at least in recent times, I've often heard. Um, with, as far as I know, with that auction, the, the specific aim was to raise the quality and the price of the uh, local produce. And, and, uh, say anything about it. that. Was Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sara Pujal and I will present you the initial results of a work that we're currently carrying out uh, together with Tania Menho and Mark James here in the audience uh, from the Coastal Resources Management Group at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, so what we've done is we've coupled geopositional data with meteorological uh, variables for a specific uh, small scale fishery state in Scotland. Why are we, why are we doing this? Uh, because we want to uh, understand or to know what meteor conditions prevent fishermen from going fishing or why are they going fishing? And why are we only uh, using uh, meteorological conditions? Because in, uh, uh, in the framework of uh, the CIFICS project, um, 105 uh, fishermen were interviewed in 40, around 40 uh, different ports in Scotland. And uh, they were asked to organize from uh, the most important to the least important, which was uh, the main reason why they wouldn't go uh, fishing. And around 95% of them said that the first reason that would prevent them from going fishing was uh, bad weather. It was followed by uh, low catch rates, uh, rates uh, vessel problems, personal problems like uh, lack, uh, lack of crew. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> only? Five more minutes only? <laughs> so, and this does not depend on uh, Vessel size, large vessels in this case are vessels between 10.5 meters to 12 meters and overall, or small vessels. Obviously, small vessels would not go fishing if the, if the weather is bad uh, compared to uh, large vessels. But the scale of large and small vessels, we know what we're talking about here, right? I, that's not my finger again. Okay, yeah. It does not depend. Uh, on the species either, um, it does not depend on the region. This is region uh, is either west of Scotland or east of Scotland. And uh, what, uh, what, what do we understand for meteorological data when they say bad weather? Is it bad wind? Is it bad uh, waves? Is it bad currents? Uh, they usually said bad wind, most uh, like 90% of them said bad wind, but we really know that sometimes it's not only bad wind, it can be a low, uh, Low speed wind, but combined to with the with the currents that would prevent them from going fishing. Or sometimes you could have a uh, swell sea in, uh, in in the area that would prevent you from fishing as well. So in this case, uh, we are uh, only using wind, waves, and uh, currents, and we are using speed and direction from wind as well as from currents and significant wave height and uh, direction from uh, for the for the waves. And what about the tides? Because we all know that the tides are also important. So in the database that we are using, and I will show you in the in, uh, in, in a few slides, um, the currents pro, uh, or uh, the, the currents um, done by the tides are already included, but not the sea level rise uh, of the tides, okay? So uh, these are the data sources that we're using. We are using the uh, Copernicus website, uh, although uh, the wind is uh, not exactly in the Copernicus website, it's in the ERA5 um, uh, data, um, data thing, sorry. Uh, we, uh, we get the 10 meters uh, U component, the 10 meters B component, and the currents and the, are the, and the waves do uh, come from the same database. And you will see the differences between them. And they do come from the CMEM, the CMEMS uh, website, currents northward and eastward sea water velocity. And for the waves, we're using uh, main wave height, uh, significant wave height of the main uh, of the main peak, wave from direction, and we're also uh, downloading downloading 
the period at the spectral peak, so we can distinguish whether it is C or swell uh, C that we're getting. Um, I'm sorry because you can you won't be able to see here, but um, if you look at the spatial uh, resolution, the spatial resolution of the wind that ERA five provides is 25 to 25 kilometers square. And if we compare, this is the same map as this one, um, and these are the red knots. Okay. Whereas uh, the currents and waves that we are uh, getting from uh, Copernicus. The resolution of the last uh, product that they have is 1.4 times 3 kilometers squared. So, in the same area, we have in the same area, we either have this resolution for waves and currents or this resolution for, uh, for the wind. Moreover, um, wind does not depend on whether the point is on land or on the sea. But for waves and currents, we have problems with the intertidal areas. And it was really nice. Or it was an opportunity to work in areas like this one because there are a lot of intertidal areas that uh, sometimes they have water, sometimes they don't have water depending on the tides. So, what do we do with the intertidal areas? We fill the data that um, uh, that we have uh, in this um, in response, and you will see the um, characteristics of how we do it later. What about the geopositional data? Because I said that I was presenting a coupling system between geopositional data and meteorological data. The geopositional data that we are using, we, uh, we have been following for more than, uh, for around two years, uh, four different, four, 40 uh, vessels, krillers, uh, local, they are called, locally called krillers, but they're uh, um, pots and traps, and they're targeting lobsters, crabs, and nephrons. Um, these vessels are uh, operating in the West Islands, the, the outer area this year. So this is the UK map, and this is Scotland in the northwestern part of Scotland. This has, these are the outer area. The 40 vessels that we have, uh, most of them have a length overall below below 12 meters, and this is uh, the type of uh, gear that they're using. They're using passive gear, so it's head pots and traps. And these are uh, the type of vessels that we that we are. Uh, following or targeting. Uh, the device, I'm not gonna get into detail uh, with this. Uh, the devices that we're using are commercial devices, uh, Teltonica FNB204. They provide us with a GNSS and GSM uh, antenna and also an accelerometer. And um, although they, uh, they send the data through the GSM system every month, every minute, they can also store up to six months of internal memory. And we record, um, data every and there are also changes in course of around speed of around or distance so uh, they so they can so change um, their ping so um in here you see one year of data for the different vessels this is around a million of points uh, as I said 40 vessels around 3,000 trips 3,000 trips. And it's covering an area, so from the uh, south to the tip of the north, it's 210 kilometers, and the wider part of the area is 50 kilometers, around 4,000 um, kilometers of coastal line. So now you see the data that we're playing with, and I'll show you how do we combine them, how do we wet them. Uh, so the first thing that we have to do is we have to interpolate the data where we don't have data where we don't have data in the currents and the waves. Remember that I told you before. So, uh, well, I data with arrow means that there is data. Uh, sorry, um, red star is no data. Uh, green star with arrow means that there is data. There is no data, obviously, in the black area because it's uh, on the ground. So what we do is um, the red starts we interpolate the data with a cubic interpolation at every time step after that so we we have a track right and what we want to obtain from the track is at every point of the track we want to have which is the wave height which is the current which is the wind the direction and the speed so um and we have points i said every 30 minutes but after the post process we have points every minute and the temporal resolution and i forgot to say that previously the temporal resolution of both wind and uh, current and waves is one hour. So for the temporal interpolation, we use a very simple linear interpolation between uh, between the points. And then there comes the spatial interpolation. Once we have 
filled all the blank areas. We interpolate within each square because we can have more than one point in one of the, of the elements of the mesh. And we do that with a bilinear interpolation. So these are the results. I, I don't want you to focus on that one first. Let me first explain you what that is. This is a single trip of a vessel in, 2000, uh, in 2021, June. A single vessel in this, uh, in this um, graphic, you can see the hour they left. So the trip starts here at 3 a.m. and it comes back at 12 o'clock, around 12 o'clock in the morning. If we look at the tidal height, the tidal height of the same track, we can see how it's it's living when the tidal when the tide is low. The tide is around 1.5 meters. High tide is here with 4.5 meters, and then comes back uh, to get the lowest tide when when he comes back. And if we, if we look specifically at the different variables that I showed you, we have here the wave. So this is significant wave height. This is uh, the wave direction from. This is the current speed. This is the current direction from. And then finally, you have the wind state. And um, in terms of uh, uh, what is interesting of here, so because there are a lot of colors, because I love, I love uh, coloring. Uh, so it's inter what is interesting here? You can see you can see here how during the trip there is no change on the wave direction. So we're talking about um, nine-hour trip, right? There's no change on the wave direction. However, there is change on the wave height. There's also change on the current speed and a lot of change on the current direction. Because as I said it in the beginning, the current includes the current produced by the tides. And uh, on the wind speed, you can also see how it left when the wind speed was high at five meters per second and came back when the wind was low. So maybe this is a threshold that they can, uh, they can manage five meters per second. And the wind speed, uh, the wind direction changed significant, significantly during the trip. So what do we do with this data? So now we have very like high resolution spatial data of uh, the track, the weather, the wind, anything. We want to know what happens to days that they don't go to the sea. So how do we infer the information the days that they don't go to the sea? So the, uh, what we do is we usually work with monthly data. So this is a month of the data. This is a month data of the same vessel that you saw before. And uh, through a random forest process that we that we have already trained, we know which of the points are points where they're actually fishing. So these are the tracks, and the red points are points where they're fishing. And so what we do is we create a context hull of the points that they are actually fishing, and then obtain the mean and maximum uh, values of the wave, the wind, and the currents in the, in this particular area. And uh, so these are the initial results. In here, what you have is uh, the current magnitude, the speed of the current uh, in blue, the wind speed in uh, red, and the wave height, the significant wave height in, uh, in green, the days that they were fishing, okay? So you can see how, for instance, this first day they left when the wind speed was higher, well, they had higher wind speeds and lower uh, significant wave heights, whereas, and here it's the opposite. So there's no current relation. We already know that, that there's no current relation between wind and wave, wind and wave height. What is preventing them from going fishing? That's the question we're trying to answer here. And um, after, uh, after doing the convex schools analysis, uh, we can obtain the maximum values the days that they were not fishing. So in this, in this graphic, you can see, um, I don't know if you see very well from, from the back, but like gray lines are the days that they were not fishing. Dark lines are Sundays, just to have an idea of the scale. And, and okay, well, there's one day that they went fishing where they have high current speeds and low wave heights. And there is one day that they didn't go fishing that they had like high wind speeds, low um, wave, significant wave height. If we create like the first um, analysis that we're, we're doing is uh, simple box plots of wind, currents, and waves. Um, the day that there was no fishing activities, these are maximum values, these are median values of 
having uh, waves for uh, wind currents and waves. They didn't go, the days that they didn't go fishing, the maximum values of the wind speed was larger than the days that they went fishing. And it happens the same with the median values. In the currents, it's, it doesn't happen, it's not the same. So there's, they have uh, high current speeds the days that they didn't go fishing and lower current speeds the day that they went fishing, but not on the median, well, a little bit, but not on the median side. This is just the analysis of the one single vessel in one month. And then uh, you have uh, there uh, the waves. And we also added, and uh, the people like that, uh, <laughs> we also added the fuel cost. That's the only social socioeconomical data that we've included there. Um, and interestingly, in this particular fisherman did not care at all about the fuel cost, as you can see here. So the fuel cost was lower when he wasn't going fishing and was, was higher when he was going fishing. Uh, when I did this, um, this plot with the entire fleet of the, of the month of June, there was no difference between the days that they didn't go fishing and the days that they were fishing. And we would have also to look at this carefully now that the fuel cost is more uh, different than it was as it was a year ago. Which are the next steps? Uh, the next steps that uh, we're, we're planning are driven by the following uh, questions. So what are the primary meteorological variables affecting the decision on going fishing? I mean, is wind more important? Is current more important? Is wave height more important? Is the combination of the different ones more important? Is the length of the vessel a key parameter for extreme conditions? Obviously, the, the answer is yes, but we have to prove that, or we want to prove that. And how are the meteorological conditions affecting the fishermen's decision going fishing? This is more or less the same as I said <laughs> at the first question. It's not the same question if you ask, why are you going fishing, that why are not you going fishing? It's like studying uh, droughts or studying uh, floods. It's not the same. <laughs> And uh, we also uh, have to take into account other variables such as uh, the cost of the bay, the seasonality or catchability of the target species, and the, avail the, avail the availability of crew, et cetera. And um, thank you very much. Do we have questions in the room? No, but the model is ready to uh, to couple it with uh, as long as the date dates from 2018, because before 2018, the Copernicus projects changed their um, their uh, spatial resolution, and then the model has to change. Um, it's the model is ready for uh, any other. Uh, Do we have questions from the? Yeah. Yes, please. I have some results. Do you have any intention to use that information for matching the? Just for example, we can suggest that the question is that I was asking if you are using this information. Is that the so we are thinking that this is because I think that in those areas, the four would be some seasonal moments of order I don't know if you have in mind that this information will be also it will be useful uh, definitely we, we will first have to analyze like step by step and um as i said um, the model is ready for any other type of uh fisheries and i think it is it is useful because we're talking about high spatial resolution data not only on the track but only on the on the meteorological conditions along the track thank you yes thanks for the very interesting presentation your um bar charts where just enough 95 percent of the fishermen answered that bad weather is not no an object is, is not um, affecting their decision to go go not going fishing uh and that uh, regardless of the vessel size small medium large all answer the same weather is not it's not a it's the problem is the, the main problem, problem. Well, but in the in the bar chart when the when you 
when we uh, implemented on the fisherman's answers, they said uh, small, medium, large, uh, but weather is the same, has yes. the same importance uh, regardless of where the vessel size. Uh, is that because different fishermen have a different perception of what bad weather is for their craft? Well, there is a slight variation. So the smaller the vessel, yes. the so 100% of the vessel, 100% of fishermen with vessels uh, with length overall below 9.5 meters said that they couldn't go fishing for bad weather. But I think that the scale of the length overall that we're talking here doesn't make a difference. It would make a difference if it was a 50 meters vessel or 20 meters vessel compared to 10 meters vessel, but from 9.5 meters vessel to 12 right. meters vessel, I don't think that makes that difference. There's a slight difference. <coughs> I have a question regarding uh, the system, uh, the management system. Is it a forecast or they have over lobsters? Just how I don't understand the, the catches managed. Do they have a forecast? Oh, because uh, we hear a lot from fishermen that when they have a quota, they have very little time to fish, yeah. so they have to go even if the this weather is strong. It's not worth fishing. So they fish are free to fish. Yeah, it's a Yeah, and also the price of the lobster. I don't know if that's a and well, we have not included that, and I was expecting the, the answer yeah. that question. We have not included that. That's a very common reason for not going fishing when the prices are very really low. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Can we invite Matteo Stefani? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Matteo Scaponi. I'm a um, consulting engineer in the Wolfson unit, which is a small uh, marine technology outfit in the University of Southampton in, uh, in England. And um, I'm going to talk to you, talk to you about uh, some uh, tests that we did on a small fishing vessel stability criterion called the, the Wolfson method, which is now part of the under 15 meter uh, code of practice uh, that covers uh, fishing vessel safety throughout the uh, UK. And I should mention that this, this work was enabled by the Lloyd's Register Foundation for a £10,000 uh, grant. So um, some, ah, some statistics, I'll uh, uh, read off the uh, header for you. So this is from uh, EMSA, the European Maritime Safety Agency. Uh, the number of EU vessels lost between 2011 and 2020. So as you can see, there hasn't nothing, not very much has changed between the 11, 15, and 16, 20, where about 60, uh, uh, a bit more 60 than 60 percent uh, um, vessels that were lost were sadly fishing vessels. And as you can see on the left and on the right hand side uh, plot, the green line, the, the grand total line um, showing the uh, aggregated vessel losses, is driven by the uh, fishing vessel losses, which is quite worrying in a, um, in, I think, in a conference where uh, we address the sustainability of small scale um, fisheries. Um, let's let's uh, sort of switch uh, to the focus on the UK situation and um, on the UK stats in 2020, uh, 2021. Uh, I've highlighted this uh, because this uh, has, uh, has been, it shows an ongoing issue with uh, um, uh, small um, UK fish vessels. By small, I mean under 15 meter uh, overall length, which is the uh, what classes 
what's classed as small uh, in the uh, in UK uh, fishing policy. Um, so in 2020, seven vessels were sadly uh, lost, and um, I will link this uh, a number of fishing vessels lost with uh, fatalities in a in a second. Uh, what's also worrying is that uh, if you combine that with a fleet composition for 2020, 90% of the vessels that were lost were, uh, so 90% 90, 90 of the uh, UK uh, registered vessels were, um, and still are, under 15 uh, metres. So um, how to link this to fatalities? Uh, uh, this is a quote from the uh, Chief Inspector of uh, Marine Accidents, uh, Andrew Moll. Uh, saying that 10 commercial fishermen uh, lost their lives in 2021. That's the number six uh, here is vessels. 10 is sadly the number of losses uh, um, uh, caused by these uh, accidents. And this is the highest annual figure for a decade. Um, and it's a short, a little short, as you said, uh, of one death per thousand qualified fishers. And sadly, this is not an unusual statistic. Uh, it applies throughout the developed countries where the one in a thousand uh, is, is a common theme. Um, and also the um, one in a thousand is likely to be um, um, an estimate which is going to be worse for uh, um, developing countries where there's no formal reporting system where accidents are reported, are uh, investigated, uh, um, and then the, the community is fed back with the results from, from those uh, uh, findings, in particular how to avoid those casualties from um, happening again. Um, any common themes? Uh, I would say yes, then this is, uh, this is back to EMSA, so this European statistics. 64% uh, of the fishing vessel accidents um, occurred uh, unroped. So from the point of port departure, to the fishing grounds, uh, the fishing effort, and then back to port. Uh, that's sixty-seven percent of the sixty-four percent of the accidents. And by accident, I mean everything, any casualty with a ship. So no uh, bruises, to the no no cuts, no loss uh, limbs, but it's uh, capsizes, uh, swampings, thunderings, uh, collisions, fire explosion, or all, all the all the uh, accidents affecting the ship. As a, as a whole, and there uh, towards the result. So the unroute segment is, is a problem. Uh, the um, waters within territorial limits are a problem. 58% uh, of fish and vessel accidents uh, in 2020 occur within the 12 nautical mile limit. And then, uh, apologies if this plot is a bit low, but uh, in terms of uh, vessels, are there any vessels that are more at risk than others? And the question is, uh, again, yes. Uh, vessels like trawlers that uh, carry heavy gear and they uh, fish um, and they rely on oversight lifts or overstern lifts of heavy uh, nets, often filled with uh, uh, rocks, stones, as well as as well as catch. Uh, they are uh, they are at risk, and to the point where fifty seven percent of the fatalities took place on board um, trawlers uh, in 2014-2020. Now, uh, the, um, the stability guidance that we, we developed over the years, uh, now it's been 15, 15 years, uh, stems from, minute, from a research project conducted by one of my colleagues for the Maritime and Coastal Agency, trying to uh, sort out the, um, the ongoing um, issues with uh, fish and vessel casualties. And uh, uh, again, I'll mention significant wave height uh, for the second time today. Uh, we found a correlation between three key areas, which, is, uh, which are vessel size, expressed in terms of uh, length uh, and beam. Um, vessel stability expressed by some uh, obscure naval architecture jargon, uh, which is the range of stability and the maximum writing moment, which is a specific characteristics of the vessel design, but also takes into account the way the vessel is loaded. Uh, a vessel overloaded, uh, that's overloaded or undertaking a heavy lift over the side, so it's heat over to port or starboard, will have uh, a worse stability than a uh, vessel that's uh, uh, in perfect textbook conditions uh, at poor departure and with no action boards and the gear on deck. Uh, so that's uh, um, again, this, uh, 
um, vessel size, there's stability, and there's significant weight height. Um, and our findings from after testing in the towing tank, more than 800 uh, combinations of best gear positions, levels of stability, and, uh, and uh, wave uh, patterns, uh, our finding is that there, there is a link between size, stability, and uh, weather conditions in terms of uh, wave height. And there's a critical significant wave height that's driven by the size and stability, and above that wave height, uh, any best is, is at risk of being overwhelmed by the by a sea state and will eventually uh, um, capsize. I'll uh, um, move quickly to, the, to this, this diagram. Uh, this is the diagram that uh, uh, represents uh, the key findings uh, uh, back in uh, 2006, and is the one that's been updated recently uh, by uh, myself um, and colleagues. So the, the gray area is the initial area where uh, the cash of the, the um, um, point on tests. So the, Model test of small boats about to one to two meters over length in a controlled environment. So all of these suggested that there's a safe zone for a vessel and there's a safe, there's an unsafe zone. And it varies, it varies with size, it varies with uh, uh, wave height, but there's always going to be an unsafe zone for any size vessel. Uh, and this has been confirmed by casualties. So uh, I'm always intimidated when I show this graph to an audience uh, because each point is a casualty. And uh, it's a capsized casualty. So there's normally fatalities uh, associated with each and every of those points. Um, so the uh, black box. Um, and the formula is a line, it's a simple straight line from the origin. And uh, it suggests that as you, as everything, everything is constant, the length of the beam of the vessel, so the length uh, overall and the width of the vessel are constant, the stability is constant, wave height will be such that. Uh, as you, as you move up towards the, the top of the block, that you're always going to be in an unsafe zone. And that's why I'm, I was slightly worried about the, uh, the, the perception of uh, um, um, how fishermen uh, perceive about weather, because it's very much driven by size and it's very much affected by wave height in our experience. Uh, so yes, that should be, should, it's a variable that should be taken into account. Uh, these are new data, uh, and the data I've, uh, I've added to that plot were basically driven by accident investigation reports throughout the, uh, these nations here, uh, where there's a formal reporting system in place, so accidents are reported, uh, vessels are, as appropriate, uh, rescued or salvaged, so, so lifted up from the bottom of the sea, uh, assessed, in terms of stability, and then just are drawn and findings are disseminated to the fishing community and to uh, um, um, scientists. Uh, all of these reports are uh, publicly available. You can uh, find the uh, conclusions and the recommendations. This is the UK uh, investigation body, which was uh, um, um, covered most of the reports we've been looking at. So the initial casualty data were. 13 points, the black boxes, the uh, black um, box in the previous graph, we've added 17, and they, in short, that trend has been, has been confirmed. Um, so it's still, it's still appropriate for, if, if a vessel has a form of stability assessment, so it's being uh, looked at by a naval architect, it's being deemed uh, safe or unsafe against some formal, uh, um, stability criteria, well, well known to the international uh, community. And then, so this range and this maximum writing moment are set, uh, then you can tell where the envelope of a safe uh, operation is for that vessel. But this is if the vessel has a formal stability assessment. So if the vessel comes with a stability booklet, so a small booklet worth about between 500 and 5,000, and 7,000 euro to the owner, uh, people can work out uh, how what's the maximum significant wave height where they can safely operate. Now, what happens if um, what happens if a vessel doesn't have such uh, stability information? This is normally the case for the under 15 meter feet, which, as you might remember, 
are the worst affected in terms of uh, uh, accident, capsizes, and loss of life. Uh, from the previous blocking zone, we've drawn, we've taken a step, we took a step forward uh, back in 2006, uh, and that was uh, how to uh, indicate to a fish, the fisherman or a, the, the owner and the skipper of an unregulated vessel, what's the safe envelope for operating is on vessel in various, uh, in a specific sea state and in relation to a specific level of loading. And the answer is, uh, essentially uh, in the next example. So in, this is a specific vessel which I investigated back in 2015. Uh, it's a scallop dredger that capsized and uh, lost and, uh, and founded off the south of England. It's a fishing vessel JMT and it's a 11.5 meter scallop uh, dredger. Uh, the vessel was completely unregulated at that time. Uh, and uh, it was it was apparent from the track record of uh, of the vessel that there was no attempt in uh, uh, keeping track how stability the stability of the vessel changed for years. So yeah. So this is it. Uh, that's the uh, how the previous block uh, translates to uh, an unregulated vessel. Uh, this is uh, a stability notice, and you can see it here. There is a maximum recommended sea state for the vessel to operate, and it's uh, it's related to the vessel's freeboard. So it's the distance between top of deck outside and the waterline, and there's a simple traffic light system uh, telling fishermen what where what's safe and what's unsafe as you operate. And as you can see here, I'll skip quickly to the uh, last slide. Uh, the JMT report found that. Uh, in this condition number nine, where the vessel was actually in operation, the, uh, it went from an, the amber zone of the traffic system down to the uh, danger of capsize. And so as a result, it capsized in a small, relatively small sea, but not because it was, um, um, there was a particularly big wave, but just because the vessel was just white, not in wait, waiting to happen. And uh, I'll, my last slide will be this. So the, um, the Borfson uh, guidance, so the traffic light system, the stability notice in the freeboard mark and are captured in the uh, under 15 meter color practice uh, for under 15 meter fishing vessels. Uh, and um, if anyone, anyone's interested in knowing the details of this, uh, come and uh, talk to me uh, later or whenever you're free. Thanks very much. Yes, we don't have time for questions now, but uh, welcome to ask material questions during the And then we come to our last presentation of this session, which we will have online. And we will welcome Raquel de la Cruz. Uh, she is not on. We check with. So maybe if you have questions to <laughs> or to all of the other presenters, uh, we are checking it. Uh, Raquel is online. I have a question. You said that the stability booklet is only 5,000 to 7,000 pounds. So what does it consist of? Are you doing tests? Well, this is... Every vessel has... Yes, for, for, I mean, this is something we also uh, do for as part of what we do we are consultancy outfit. So if you if you imagine a uh, the typical unregulated fish vessel like Jane, uh, it's a vessel you don't have, you don't know anything about, uh, both in terms of hull shape and stability. So you need to scan the vessel first, uh, you need to get a the shape of the vessel, then a the the 3D shape to a, um, to a uh, marine design software stuff. Uh, each each individual uh, outfit has his own one. This one they rely upon. Uh, so they are trusted software. They're not sort of, uh, not sketchy. Uh, something that the regulators will uh, have a point. They will do the calculations and they will uh, assess the rest. But then the limitation of stability booklets are many. So the first one is. Only if you want to be within the um, five thousand to six, six uh, seven thousand 
uh, bracket that I mentioned earlier, you have to assess the vessel in some nominal group. So port departure, uh, mid voyage, and port arrival. Port departure means an ideal condition with full tank, not by many small scale, small scale uh, uh, fill of the tanks. They depart. Expensive. Um, gear on deck, uh, which is unrealistic. They need the gear at over the side or over the stern or up, depending from the derricks to be able to fish. And there's also some other unrealistic conditions. So, um, uh, but they are not, not as important as the tanks. So, departure is unrealistic. Mid voyage is unrealistic because it, the vessel doesn't not supposed to be fishing. Gear is still back. And arrival is also unrealistic because you've got uh, um, again gear on deck and you've got uh, full fish holes, but not very many boats will have the luxury of sewing fish in the hold. They would normally just leave it on deck. It's more convenient, it's faster, and there's uh, and it just uses time market for their catch. Uh, so what I'm saying is uh, I've, we've made this part to the regulators countless times. Even if the fishermen so contentious that uh, uh, performs in the test of the vessel, even if it doesn't have to, the mission doesn't have to, then what they get is, is a booklet which has no relation to the actual uh, stability of the vessel because these are <coughs> mystical. The less optimistic is when you do an asymmetric click. So one dredge is on board. The other one is this and the R uh, or down down in C, but perhaps it's for rocks. So the point of the guidance is that uh, it's free to anyone. You can go to a, to a couple of websites and you can download your um, spreadsheet at your length and beam for the vessel and you get the notice. So it's not some you know, it's not a service that we sell, it's something that's out there uh, for the fishing. Uh, and it's um, and it's a powerful tool because it doesn't cover just the three parts, the three conditions. It covers the whole operation when it's lifting, when it's uh, underloaded, when it's uh, peeling over to one side, when it's trimming down by the bow. It 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 does uh, it does pretty much everything. That's one reason why we need a Thank you very much. I really don't know how you do that, but stability of boats. I've been fishing in many boats, and there's always they have been made the same person, and there are some that move like crazy, and some that are very stable. And I, we never understood why it was like that. So maybe you can ask the fishermen as well. <laughs> well we've asked many, yeah. And yeah. if they have to, if they avoid having to. Uh, have a stability booklet made, they will, because it's very expensive. If they cannot avoid it, it's that a tick box exercise. Yeah, yeah. They okay. do it because they have to, yeah. but they it doesn't yeah. end. A mystery for me, <laughs> why some vessels move horribly, and what other ones were, were built by the same person, they were very stable and nice, I could go with them because with the others, you just get a <laughs> second, <laughs> second you are. <laughs> Uh, do we have more questions? We have time because uh, there's uh, no. I have a question to Victor, actually. Um, the price of the fish that they were selling directly was the same as the price that they were selling to the normal distributors. No, no, not at all. Uh, it was higher. Yeah. But even this <laughs> price difference didn't allow them to. Of course, they got more uh, rent from selling, but not enough. They for got a higher price, but it was also more good compared to us. Yeah. Leaving the fish at. at they uh, didn't compensate any. It's a difficult question to answer straight. And, and I think that the aggregated answer is that the higher proportion of uh, their income. They got from direct market. Mm -hmm. The higher proportion of their cash, they sold to the more influential that was for them to be able to keep them in the fish. This is obvious. Mm -hmm. yeah. But for, for some of them, we had one fisher 
for a pair of fishers, a uh, married couple. They sold 80% of their cash uh, and 20% directly. The price was higher than the percent that they sold directly, but the average didn't do that much on the average. And do you think that if they had a label like branding the fish, that they could even get better prices? Well, it's a discussion that we didn't think, but, but uh, depending on, on the brand and label, it can be a lot of problems. They but they were not doing that, they were not branding that. Uh, one of the, because there was one uh, community support. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a sort of, or their brand name mm -hmm. was one type, uh, not by any third part. Mm -hmm. Depends on what you mean with brand. Yeah. They branded it as a local fish. This is fish. local fish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think they all did that, maybe not in brand, but they all communicated. Yes. The, uh, the locales of their produce, the freshness of their produce, the quality that came with it. They, they were good at Yeah. Thank you. Another question? More questions? <laughs> okay. Then we have two minutes to five. So thank you very much. That was, I enjoyed very much the presentations and the questions and see you in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.